Happy New Year, Firmly Rooted. So we got a chance now to do what's right when it comes to the wise men, the magi, and understand the theme for today's message is don't miss it. There's really two Roman numerals in this whole message. Don't miss Jesus. Don't miss your response, but let's see how we do. Everybody needs to know, and if you're from firmly rooted, you know that you take your wise men away from the manger scene, away from the stable, away from all of that, because they're not there. So even in our Christmas program, when we have the, the stars there, but the wise men are not yet. But let's talk about these guys. A star appears when Jesus is born, that God made it so that physically, physically, in the spatial universe, there was going to be a declaration physically, not just angels piercing through the sky in a moment, but for at least two years, a star existed, and these astrologers, these wise men from the east, saw it, and they went to go see the one who was born king of the Jews. Now, you ask yourself the question, how would they have known all of that? How would they have any clue? Well, just remember that four or five hundred years before the birth of Jesus, in the 700s B.C., Jerusalem, Israel, is destroyed. Judah is destroyed, and Jewish people are dispersed. Many of them went to Babylon, others went other places, but Jewish people were dispersed. No differently than Jewish Christians being dispersed, and the book of Acts, under pressure, they start dispersing. So it's believed by most historians that at least part of, if not the whole book of Isaiah, is in the hands of these astrologers because of Jewish people that were in the area and had them, and they added the book to their smart literature, stuff that was from people and nations and what they believed. So you got to wonder, see, they see this star one day, and it's not a star they normally see because they're astrologers, and they, they notice the star's not, it's like staying, it's staying there, it's, it's not moving. And all of a sudden, something in their head says, there's literature in the Old Testament, there is literature in the book of Isaiah, there's literature that says that there's going to be this star, this thing. So something's happening. So I want you to realize that... They spend two years traveling to Bethlehem. Jesus is now two years old. He's no longer a brefe. He's no longer a suckling infant, but he is a techne. He's a child. Hence, all your wise men need to be moved, put on, the, put on an, I don't know, a shelf someplace or on a, on a piano someplace because they're still traveling today, all right? They're actually just beginning their travels at the time period that we would call Christmas. Why is the sermon series or this message, why is it about don't miss it? I want you to realize that they saw a star and felt compelled to do something. In 2024, the theme for 2024, from my perspective to my life and to your life, are what are you going to do? What is your response going to be to what God's doing? Somewhere in the American church, God has allowed the American church to come to church and say, good, I'm done. Coming to church is to feed us so that we can go do something in his kingdom. What I want to tell you, and I want you to realize that if you look at Scripture, anybody that has been affected by God, touched by God, they respond. I'm trying to figure out how American Christians can be touched by God and not respond. Like a woman at the well, she drops her bucket and goes into town. 
Philip goes to Nathaniel. There always seems to be this response. Right? We do it in all other sorts of things. We do it when something happens in our lives. We, you know, we celebrate when there's a birth and all these kinds of things. We do it. These guys are two years away from the birth of Jesus. And they're responding because they see a what? Star. I just want you to see it. They haven't looked at Jesus. They haven't seen Jesus. They don't know all the other prophecies. They, don't, they just see a star and they go. This year's challenge is going to be what are you going to do with what God is saying? What are you going to do with what he has done? Why are you holding it in and putting a period when it's dot, 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 what's next? But let's keep going. They follow the star all the way into Judea and all the way to Jerusalem, and all of a sudden they can't see the star, which is really odd because Jerusalem is the spiritual center of all of Judaism. Now, like you, you would think, because the star is getting closer and closer, because Bethlehem is only a day's journey away from Jerusalem. But they get to Jerusalem, right? And they're saying in their heads, this has got to be the place. This has got to be the place. This is the center. This is the center of Judaism. This is Jerusalem. Here it is. They enter into Jerusalem, and they can't see the star. So they somehow ask the right questions to the right people, and they get directed to Herod, who's king of the area. And they go to Herod, and they ask the question, where is the one who's born king of the Jews? <laughs> well, Herod says uh, to himself, I, I, uh, I'm the king, and I haven't given birth to a son. Interesting. These guys are in the wrong place looking for the right thing. They're in a king's palace, but the king doesn't have an answer. You ever gone to the wrong place to get the answer that you want? What, what are you doing? Why are you searching in the wrong place for the answer? Why are you looking for the living among the dead, the angel said? Why are you sitting in the wrong place, asking the wrong thing, looking at the wrong thing, studying the wrong thing for the answer you need? But I'm not punishing them. They're naturally falling into it. My question is, why do we do it intentionally? Why do we know we got a problem and search the wrong place for the answer? But at any rate, Herod's wise enough to go get some religious guys in the room. So he sends for religious people and says to them, Hey, you guys got this belief in a Messiah. Where's he supposed to be born? In Bethlehem of Judea, right? They, they, they've got the answer. The religious guys have the answer. The religious, the, 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 the magi, the wise men had said to, to Herod, we've come to worship him. Well, in that day, you only worship Caesar. It's all a, a dilemma. But Herod, who's not a believer, is smart enough to ask the right questions, to get the right answer, and he finds out it's Bethlehem. He lies to the wise men and says, hey, you go to Bethlehem, and you do your thing, and then come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too, which is just a lie. He wants to kill him because he sees him as a threat to the Roman Empire. Wise men say, okay, my guess is they ask somebody, which gate do we go out to go to Bethlehem? Give us some directions. They got the gate, they walked out, and lo, the star. They could see it again. Enter Jerusalem, spiritually dead, can't see it. Exit Jerusalem, there it is. Oh, you mean there's times when I can see the truth and times that I can't see the truth because of where I might be? Grab onto it. How you position your heart, how you position your life, how you position your mind, how you position a lot of things in 2024 are going to be dependent upon whether you're seeing truth or not seeing truth, whether you see it or don't see it. 
But you want to know the most startling thing? None of the religious leaders went with them. They knew that they came for two years to follow a star that they can't see. If you're a religious leader, absorb this. And now these guys are going to continue the journey and not one of the religious leaders says, I'm going to follow these guys. I'm going to follow them and find out what's going on. I'm curious. Is it possible that you can be so stuck in the mud in your philosophical view of things you won't even be open-minded to see that maybe just maybe something else might be true? On Christmas Eve, I mentioned the whole idea of, but what if it is true? At least ponder the idea that it might be true. You guys quoted the verse from Scripture about Bethlehem, and you won't even follow two guys who've been traveling for two years to find him, and they want to worship him? Where's their response? Where is the response of those religious people? They're going to miss it. Matter of fact... They've missed it for two years. Do you think they've never heard about a rumor of some stupid shepherds seeing some vision of angels? You don't think that that Jerusalem being one day's journey away from Bethlehem, that the news didn't get sent, that some crazy guys said they saw shepherds and singing and saw this baby born? How quickly? (laughs) Just, just, Just last week, We were feeling God open in heaven and earth, and now it's like, okay, that's over. Let's get back to the grindstone. Let's get I don't miss it. You say, Pastor Tom, it's impossible to miss it. Yeah. Just come talk to me. We miss it all the time. We might miss, the, you might, we might catch this, but we miss the next thing God's trying to say. We're missing the next thing God's trying to say. Because he's always talking to us, he always loves us, and his eternal truth is always there. We're not always living according to it or believing it. Why? Because we miss it. We're either in the wrong place looking for the answer, we're doing the wrong thing rather than the right thing. I don't know, but all I can tell you, don't you find it odd that no, none of the religious leaders follow those guys, just because. What if they're right? What if two years ago a Savior was born and we d- didn't know it? All right, let's move on. They get to, they get to Bethlehem. Some searches, probably some conversations. Finally, someone says, Mary and Joseph, yeah, that's their house. See, they're not at a manger, they're at a house, the Greek word, house. Jesus is a techne, he's a child, not an infant, brefe. He's two years old. They finally find him. By the way, we said as soon as they left Jerusalem, lo, the star, the Greek is, two adjectives falling all over themselves. With exceedingly great joy, they celebrated and rejoiced that there was a star, right? I mean, like, we do that sometimes, don't we? Like, we're, we're in a dark place, and all of a sudden, God beams a light in our lives, and, oh, and then we forget. We forget that he did that. And all of a sudden, we're back in darkness again. How can you be in darkness? Why are you looking among, for the living among the dead? Jesus is constantly saying to us, stay with me. Don't look at the winds and the waves. Look at me. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. These guys are beelining it to Bethlehem. They find Bethlehem. They see Jesus. They see this two-year-old boy, and they fall down and worship him. Exclamation point. Grown men fall down in front of a two-year-old boy who's probably playing with toys, and they worship him. Well, that's an interesting response. (laughs) 
It certainly wasn't one of those things like I, I went to an amusement park, been there, done that. These guys worship a two-year-old. Oh yeah, this is the same baby that John the Baptist leapt in the womb and Jesus was just conceived in Mary. This is the Jesus that Elizabeth and Mary, both moved by the Holy Spirit, began to speak prophetically about the Savior of the world. See, something about this Jesus. You get around Jesus and things start to shift and change. (laughs) The Apostle Paul. (laughs) See, you get around the living Jesus and it changes everything. I thought you were dead. You have to be dead. You have to be dead because I'm killing Christians who believe in you. Who are you? I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. And he's blind for three days to mull over the idea that he missed it. Paul missed it. He was a religious leader. He missed it. But the good news is there are men like Nicodemus. He didn't miss it. Joseph of Arimathea, he didn't miss it. We're going to find that even one of Jesus' brothers, James, didn't miss it. Well, these guys aren't missing it. They're falling down and they're worshiping this child. And they give him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You know, it is the gold for a king. The frankincense is the priest. The myrrh, death. All three, very, very expensive. All three would have allowed them to live. But they were prophetic. These guys didn't know it was prophetic. God knew it was prophetic. Isn't that crazy? God's moving history to make a census happen. God's moving these guys to go travel two years. And God moves them to give just the right gifts so that we, 2,000 years later, would understand the gifts in a way that they didn't even understand them. Well, wasn't traveling there two, two years good enough? I went on the journey. I saw the star. I got to the star. I want you to notice they were compelled to respond. In 2024, you and I are going on a journey. We have been eating God's word. We've been drinking of his grace and mercy. What is he calling us to respond with? What is he calling us to do? to say, to act. They worshiped. They gave gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They honored him as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And then an angel came and told them to not go back to Herod, and they went another way. Herod's response. When the wise men don't come back, Herod puts out an edict to kill every child two years old and under in the whole area. Every male boy. Kill them. And he does. See, in one sense, even your ignorance causes you to respond to Jesus. Just the wrong way. Pilate. Jesus says, everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And Pilate says, What is truth? And then walks out of the room. And the guy who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, just stay here for a minute and listen. Don't miss it. Herod misses it completely. He sees that as a political threat. Joseph is mourned in a dream, gets Jesus, they go to Egypt. All to fulfill prophecy, and sadly, prophecy is fulfilled when righteous children, the women, the mothers are weeping over the loss of their children. Herod wiped out every male boy, two years old and under, 
because of a kid he never saw. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I think ultimately for everyone who meets Jesus, there is a response. The question is, what's yours and what's mine? It's like answering the question, who do you say that I am? Well, Jesus, I say, you are the Christ. You are the Son of God. And then my life doesn't change at all. Where's my response? If you're the Christ, if you're the Son of God, shouldn't that do something to my life? If you're the Savior of the world, shouldn't that do something to me and through me? I want you to realize that God of the universe created Adam and Eve in the beginning to get a response. To get what? A people that would love him with their whole heart, whole mind, whole soul, and all their strength and love their neighbors themselves. He wanted created beings, man and woman, to, to love him like he loved them. It's the restoration of love. Jesus comes as the embodiment of God's love so that we might be loved by him. Well, see, love always gives, and when given, there's always a response. Explain to me why the American church who properly understands Jesus, God giving us his son, that I've received that forgiveness, and then we put a period and say, thank you. Could you just tell me that again? Just keep telling me that. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And Jesus says, go. Go make disciples. Why did only one leper come back and ten just went and lived their lives? There was no response. It's not an either or. What I've learned in my life is that as I do this balancing act between my sinful nature and my new nature, is I got to look at my sinful nature and see places where I'm not letting go. I got to see places where I, I just feel like I got to hold on to it because I'm confident. I don't trust God enough to have this spot. And, and he'll just say, he'll, he'll lovingly say, give me the spot. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Come to me. Don't hold on to that. Give it to me. The enemy's the only one wanting you to hold on to that. Sit there with a period and you're holding on to this yuck. At the end of this year, this is time to let go of yuck. This child came to redeem us and to save us, to change our whole relationship with the Father, to set us free, to wash our sins away by His blood, to give us a new heart and a new mind, to call us to respond to live in it and walk in it and grow in it, to make this baby of faith crawl and walk and run and move so that we might become part of the kingdom of God that not even the gates of hell can stand against. Let's not be the religious leaders who don't even go to Bethlehem to check it out. Certainly, we're not Herod. But how about the shepherds? Who couldn't help but go see, and once see, couldn't help but tell people. How about the wise men? Couldn't help but go see, but once they heard, they told people. Today, How about we just rejoice? We rejoice because the God of the universe steps into our dark, ugly world and says, I love you. And right after that, I know. You know what? I know everything. I know you. I created you. I know what you're holding on to. I know what you're dealing with. I know. When are you going to come to me? When are you going to come to me? So that I can free you from that and I can help you get to where you need to be next. Because son, daughter, I got a plan for you. It's not to destroy you. It's a plan that's to for you. It's a plan for your future. It's a plan for you to be who I've called you to be. So let today, I pray... Let your heart, like, balance between scales. Not doubting your faith. Not doubting your redemption. 
wondering whether there's a part of God's message to you that you're missing. I'd invite you to look at your relationships. And where can Christ reconcile things in your relationships with other people? If you're living a life where you don't have enough, let's work towards an understanding that God is enough and be content with what we have. I'm all alone. No, you'll never be alone because the Holy Spirit dwells in you because the body of Christ is your brothers and sisters. You have a family. Do you see it? Those wise men had to leave life, homes, and everything to go. Disciples left their nets, and they went. In order to respond to God, there's things we have to leave. I'm asking you in this day before the new year, as you're thinking about resolutions of what you want in life and what you want for your life, and I'm asking you to take a serious look spiritually at where you're at. Where's the Groundhog's Day in your life that no matter what you do, it just keeps being the same? And ask yourself the question, does God want it to be the same? No! He's come that you might have life and have it abundantly. So wherever you don't have an abundant life, let's hit it. Let's hit it. And then respond when he, when he heals it. Respond when he does what he does. And watch, you'll find somebody who's in the same position you were in, now is hearing you tell a story, and now I'm set free. And now that person, you see it? But if there's no response, there's nobody here. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and grace. We thank you that you're a good, good Father. We thank you for sending Jesus in the world. Father God, we're firmly rooted ministries. We have spent years now firmly rooting ourselves in your unconditional love and your truth. We have seen healings. Chuck talked about healing from last week, just this morning. Father God, we have had people break satanic, sinful chains in their lives, set free. Father God, we thank you for the miracles. We thank you for that. For each of those individuals that I personally know of, I can see that they had to have a response. Their response was one of positiveness. Their response was one of rejoicing. Their response was an upward movement. Father God, I'm asking that all of Firmly Rooted, that we would get more people in daily devotions, that we would get more people involved in life groups, that we would get more people involved so that we can establish numbers? No, so that we might, as the body of Christ, as individuals, as sons and daughters, Come to be who we're supposed to be. Allow your spirit to do in us the work that's necessary so that we can die to the old and rise to the new. Because you have come to make all things new. We prayed in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. All right. Whew. God is good. And all the time.